I'm dealing with the subject of hate, um, trying to deal with it in the almost the stereotypically conventional way, uh, dealing with, say, the Nazis. Um, they've come down to us as sort of you know, legitimate objects of hate. Um, and I'm not so sure that I disagree with that, but I still want to examine what that actually implies, that... Um, say that hate can, or perhaps to ask the question rhetorically, can hate be justified? Um, or does it have uses? Does it actually have a use? Does it um, do something positive for us? I mentioned that it, it can sort of, I guess, inoculate us against against being duped or being taken advantage of or being ambushed, having our rational faculties ambushed by someone who is using subtle means of persuasion, uh, charisma, um, appeals to emotions, appeals to um, subconscious things, subconscious fears and desires, this sort of thing and very cleverly mixing it in with other things to sort of, as Goebbels would have put it, make the most atrocious lie quite palatable. Um, that, too, is sort of what has come down to us from the Nazis. Uh, an incredibly civilized people, high, highly cultured people, the Germans, um, whom you would think would be immune to this. They're also known for being very rational and not letting their emotions take control of them, uh, say in the same way that <laughs> the Irish, my people, uh, are known for their emotions running away with them. Um, but still, the supremely rational, supreme, supremely disciplined Germans fell for this idea. Uh, so I'm thinking perhaps reason isn't enough to sort of prevent ourselves from falling into these sorts of situations where we have to face the terrible moral dilemmas uh, inherent in what the Allied soldiers saw when they liberated the concentration camps in the Second World War. You have to sort of... A paradigm shift or a paradigm reinforcement is going to take place in that kind of circumstance. You're going to have to, have to I think, revamp or perhaps reevaluate all of your moral and ethical thinking that you've had up to that point where you'd assumed that such things simply couldn't happen or whatever. Um, you might have thought that ideas of evil were kind of silly and outdated and juvenile until you, you know, you enter Bergen-Belsen with the British and Canadians in 1945 and see 13,000 unburied bodies laying there in front of you that died completely unnecessarily and sadistically. Um, you know, you see that, then you have to, you have to make uh, some sort of assessment of it. And what does it mean of, in terms of your view of the world, in terms of good and evil and all that sort of thing? And I would say that a number of people, a lot of people, were broken by that. And a lot of people who never really set foot even in Europe were broken by what happened during the, during the Holocaust. Uh, and not just the inmates, not just Jewish people who would have sort of identified most closely with the inmates, although, you know, Roma and Slavs and people like that uh, were locked up as well and gassed. Um, not just them, but people who up until then had sort of thought, well, I don't live in a world in which those things happen. Human beings simply don't do things like that. So there's really no need for me to prepare myself for that possibility. And I think that's the horror of you know, things like the Third Reich. It was a gigantic ambush on just about everybody. Um, the Germans were ambushed. I don't think that they grasped what, they, what kind of a deal they'd signed with Hitler in the mid-1930s, until it was too late for anyone to do anything about it, or events were moving so rapidly and in such a complex way with so many different ways to look at it that the individual was more or less, if you ask me, in a state of confusion as to what the devil to do about it all, especially after the war had broken out. What are you going to do as a German? Um, 
it's confusing. It, 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 Hitler duped everybody. He duped the Westerners who thought they could use him against the Soviet Union. He duped the Soviet Union uh, when he th uh, duped Stalin when Stalin thought that Hitler was his friend. He duped everybody. He duped himself thinking that he could actually do it. He couldn't. He didn't have the resources. Never did. Um, but what is that? What, what is that that duped everybody? What what was the thing that was dangled in front of everyone's eyes? Um, what was that entire phenomenon of that thing, the Third Reich and all that it entailed, the World War, and uh, one could even say the Cold War that followed it? What, what, what was all of that? And what do we do about situations like that that could resurface? Um, I think that we've kind of evolved in the modern sense, a hate response in that way. Um, where, if we get a whiff of this sort of thing, if we get a whiff of, I won't say race prejudice, because that's still pretty rampant in our civilization, but I would say if we get a whiff of someone attempting to seduce you with an idea, with an ism, with uh, some kind of believe in me and I will solve all of your problems, we automatically get the hate out, kind of defensively. Uh, we automatically say, you have something to prove, Mr. or Madam Savior, to us first. You have, you have to prove that you are completely and utterly benign before we'll follow you. And we'll hold you up to such scrutiny that, um, you know, you, and, and keep you on such a short leash, in the form of, say, liberal democracy, that you can't really do any damage no matter what you want to do. And even that is kind of hate-based. Um, there's an amount of... We've seen what leadership can do. We, we've seen what charismatic leadership can do. And we've seen what happens when people unknowingly abandon their faculty of reason or unknowingly have their faculty of reason overwhelmed by the subconscious or the irrational part of us. Um, I'm often saying that logic is our tool, it's not our master, but we also use it, I think, in certain senses as a master to keep ourselves, I guess, in terms of self-discipline, to keep oneself on the, as it were, straight and narrow. Um, you keep yourself thinking logically and reasonably because if, say, you were, and as I mentioned in that in a previous video, sitting in a Vienna coffee shop in 1920 with Hitler, and you were talking to him and he started to sort of get through your defenses, you'd probably get angry or hateful inside. Um, I probably would. I'm not trying to say that I'm aloof from all, any of that kind of thing, but why would I get angry or hateful? because I would recognize that in me that is actually vulnerable to the blandishments of a charismatic and possibly evil leader. I won't say that, you know, I shouldn't say, I mean evil like evil type thing. Um, the ultimate con man type thing. And that keeps me, the hate, if you ask me, keeps me aware of the fact that I live in a world where this can happen. Um, it's a defensive thing. It's a, a means of bolstering my defenses against um, the Hitlers of this world. Uh, and the people, I guess, whom I believe might fall for the Hitlers of this world. Um, I mentioned Emma Emmanuel Goldstein, and, and one of my favorite lines from 1984 is from that Two Minutes Hate, where Winston is looking at the screen and he's seeing Emmanuel Goldstein, the ultimate scapegoat, denouncing the party and denouncing Big Brother and denouncing everybody. And the fascinating line from that was, Winston was listening to Emmanuel Goldstein and you couldn't help but think, a child could see through what this idiot is saying. But it's just clever enough that people who are less intelligent than I am are likely to fall for it. Now, human nature being what it was, I think most of us believe that we're more intelligent than, than other people. I think that we've argued that one to death. Uh, so what that means is you think that everyone else is going to fall for this guy. You know, you're the only one who can see it coming. I think we all know that feeling. And that can lead to hate, and perhaps hate of a misanthropic kind, a hate of everybody, a hate of the human species. 
um, a hate um, that can often be a case of uh, a blanket hatred of human imperfection and human susceptibility to being corrupted. Um, that's kind of the way that the elves in the Lord of the Rings saw human beings, that they're okay in many ways, but they're easily seduced by things like power and wealth and things like that. Um, especially power. Uh, and that's almost kind of like, if you've ever heard of one of these insular communities um, where... Um, they're so insular that they sort of believe that there's us and then there's everybody else. We are the chosen people and everybody else on the planet are the, I don't know, the equivalent of the Gentiles or the equivalent of the Gajos or something like this. Um, where the human race is so weak and easily corrupted that they're almost certainly going to fall in for, or fall for people like Hitler or Emmanuel Goldstein or whatever. So we end up actually reflexively or defensively hating the entire human race because of that. Um, but only hating the human race in a certain way, in some kind of abstract way. Um, not necessarily hating the person in front of you or being rude to the person in front of you because that's different. That's not just an amorphous mass. Um, you know, as Stalin said, uh, one man is a tragedy, uh, death of one man is a tragedy, the death of a million is a statistic. Or it might have been Hitler that said that, I don't know. But I think that there, that kind of plays out that way in reality. And what does that do to our view of um, the place of hate in our makeup? What does it what does it actually say about hate in and of itself? Is that necessarily a dangerous emotion to have the way that we sort of think that it is? Or is it just some sort of inoculation where I don't plan on harming anybody, but I'm keeping my hate up as a means of keeping my defenses up? Um, and that any attempt to sort of say, well, you shouldn't hate is seen as an attempt to seduce me out of being on the defensive. It's to seduce me into putting down my weapons and making myself supremely vulnerable vulnerable again. Um, hate and vulnerability, I think, are very closely related. And hate and fear, I think, are just as closely related. I think that, you know, say if you were prone to anxiety or if you were prone to, uh, um, I don't want you call it, paranoia, worry that other people are you know, that are a menace to you, you're more likely to, you're more likely to sort of use hate as a means of dealing with that. Uh, the angry loner comes to mind. So I'm fascinated by the dynamics of hate, and I'm fascinated by the fact that Ghost of Day in Person has sort of made a video, not really making a case for it, but trying to explain it in a more subtle way trying to explain it or deal with it in a way that most people aren't used to discussing. Um, but even when I'm, a, I'm willing to allow for that place for it in our civilization or in our makeup or in our thinking or in our um, way of morally approaching reality or, or our human society, that too has a danger though, of course, doesn't it? Um, you hate those that are a danger to you or those whom you perceive to be a danger to you. Um, what if you get that wrong? <laughs> um, you know, and that's also one of the reasons why I posited the thought experiment uh, about Hitler. Um, what if you get your intuitions wrong? What if you get your, your, your take on things wrong. I hate somebody, say, defensively, and my choice is to leave them alone, to avoid them forever. Okay, that's one way of, of approaching that. What if I hate somebody because I see that they're a menace, or I believe that they're a potential threat to me, and they're a subtle threat to me? 
they're not a they're not an overt threat but they're a subtle threat a threat that's latent in our society then what do i do i guess i walk around as something of a neurotic all the time um just seeing nothing but dangers everywhere or not even necessarily seeing them but they're always in the back of my mind that things are just on the well, I wouldn't say teetering on the brink, but there's always the possibility there of things going downhill really quickly. And I'd better be kind of prepared for that. And my hate keeps me strong. Um, I think that's one of the things that people will say in defense of hate. It, allow, it keeps you strong when you're being overwhelmed by all kinds of other negative stuff. Um, but again, like any other force, I think we know what the negatives are in hate. Uh, is there a golden mean in hate? Is there a way for you to be to hate the right person in the right amount at the right time for the right reasons? I suppose uh, for the right reasons, I'm not sure about that. I'd, I'd question whether or not we have enough information to truly hate anybody, anyone, you know, to identify somebody as deserving of our hate. But just because you don't hate somebody doesn't mean you can't take steps to protect yourself against that person. You know, you don't have to actually hate anybody to even kill them. Um, you don't have to hate to go off and fight a war against the Nazis. Um, so, again, all things seem to have a dual nature or a multifaceted nature. That one would have to conclude that the same goes for hate. But how do we manage hate? How do we manage it to keep it from getting out of hand? I see a menace in our world right now, hatred that's building between the West and the Islamic world, and to a lesser extent between the West and Russia. Um, how do we manage that? How do we manage the fact that we do seem to be, in some sense, in some slow, tortoise-like sense, walking towards some sort of collision course with each other, either with the Russians or with the Islamic world, uh, or this sort of thing, just this other type people that we have identified as something of a, an existential threat to us. How do we keep up, perhaps, how do we manage the hate that's always going to accompany these sorts of dynamics? Um, say, like the Cold War, where you're always on kind of a semi-war footing, but you don't really want to fight each other at all. Uh, you just want to protect yourself against the other person, um, or the other side. I think that we've all, all three of the groups that I've mentioned here, the West, the Islamic world, and Russia, have kind of taken that kind of a dynamic. They've taken a wait-and-see type thing. We'll stay strong, but we won't make any false moves here to, to provoke the other side. So is it a balance, this idea of hate? And, you know, they called it the balance of terror back in the Cold War. Um, is it a balance, or is it... Um, is it a juggling act or something like this? I don't think we're ever going to abolish hate. Um, but I think that it can be damaging to our society and our civilization and to ourselves as individuals if we don't manage it correctly. Um, if we forget why we're hating. If we forget why we even get into these conflicts. Because this always happens, if you ask me, in, in conflicts, especially ones that kind of smolder and flare up just periodically. You don't even know why you're fighting anymore. I wonder if anybody in, say, Iraq or Syria and the crazy ethnic civil wars that are taking place there on many levels and in many different contexts, I wonder if any of these people really know why they're rivals anymore. Um, but the hate is still there. And I wonder if they question it anymore. If they question it in terms of its utility, in terms of its origin, and in terms of... Uh, uh, whether or not it has taken control of them, if they're being led around by it, if it's no longer simply a tool to be used to deal with reality, to deal with the dangerous situations that can arise. Um, if hate is natural, are we in control of it, or is it in control of us? <laughs>